Um, yeah, then I worked for Hagen for a little while. And what was then, he like to work with? Hagen was, um, Hagen was crazy, <laughs> crazy and crazy smart in a different way. Um, Hagen was, this is, this is, I'll, I'll tell this story. Um, Hagen would have us come in the, the old field robotics, you know, up, up was a building C, the yeah. high, the high bay. And, um, is that the one that's, um, the planter robotics high bay or the field robotics? No, Center field high robotics. Bay? Noel Simon. Yeah. Sort of underneath Neil, yeah. Neil Simon before they built the top of it. I didn't realize there was a time when that was the case. That's interesting. Yeah. So a, that was their first. That's that, why those old windows are there in the way they are. Yeah. Those were old Bureau of Mines buildings. That uh-huh. whole Smith Hall up on up on Forbes. Yeah. And then those two buildings, Noel Simon, the kind of the foundations of, of Noel Simon. I guess it was at Noel Simon. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were two buildings that when you walked into the high bay, the FRC high bay, that was the top floor. Huh. And it went down. Which is why that's floor one today. Yeah. And like floor two and three are above that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> anyway, you know, Hagen was great to work with. Ha- same way. Give you a ton of responsibility. Say, hey. I'm going to, I want you to try to figure out X, you know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm just a kid, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a rising sophomore, going to be a junior or something, <laughs> you know, work you. He's like, well, try it. He's like, you're cheap. You don't cost me a lot. If you come up with a great idea, it's great. And that was, that was really interesting. That was the nice thing working for Hagen. That's um, pretty wild because like, I know sometimes it's exhausting putting in the management overhead to mentor like a kid that's just learning. I don't want to say there was no management. It's, it wasn't that. But but in terms of, say, you know, loosely bounded guardrails, go take a look at this. There was a it, – it was uh, – I don't even know if it matters what it was now. But it was – we were trying to convey and move material and inspect it with cameras. For, oh, that's for cool. Manufa- for, to automate some manufacturing. That's really cool. Um, pre-processing. And he just to go. I'm like, well, like just – Come up with a plan. Buy some stuff. You know, build a. You know, build a. You got an idea? I'm like, I think hey, would this work? You, you know, combination of of air and conveyances and that. He's like, that sounds cool. Build it. You know, spend a week. Spend you know at the time. I thought it was. I thought it was. It was like someone giving you a blank checkbook. Say, go. You spend. Don't spend more than a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. A ton of money when you're a kid, right? <laughs> and, and twenty. You know, over twenty five years ago, my grandfather actually started the business. Um. And he was a really interesting guy. Um, very, very interesting guy. What did he do? Like, what was his, what made him interesting? Um, a lot of things. Hard, hard to qualify in a sentence, I realize. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh. it's sort of threefold. Very, very, very smart. Um, didn't go to college, you know, of, cool. was, was of that era where, he, you know, you went to co- he went to high school. Uh, like, his high school was technical school. He went, he went for uh, machinery. That's awesome. To be a machinist. Like, that was of that, you know, he, he was... I guess my grandfather would be almost 105 if he was alive today. <laughs> um, so he was, you know, he had worked as a machinist. He worked the early part of World War II at Dravot. Oh, cool. Built, you know, building ships. So he worked as a machinist and, and, a, and a welder building LSTs, the light landing ship tank. They're the things, if you, if you look online, the, not the landing craft they used in Normandy. Like that's a Higgins boat, right? That's a Higgins boat. Yeah. The LSTs were big. They were they were called light landing ship tanks because you put a tank in them. Oh. They were, they were the ones you see in the in the Pacific where they pull up on the beach and they open and the tanks drive out. Yeah. Okay. That's right. cool. Um, so he had kind of had that in, that really interesting background, um, and then he was in. He got, he got drafted. Um, served in the war. When he got drafted after he was already building light landing ship tanks. Yeah. They, that's they, wild there were a lot yeah so we need you off the line and in the in the lines <laughs> they had enough yeah they, they were gonna this that's, is this is really off topic but i found this out talking right. very late in life that he um he's a, like i said he's a very interesting guy but he's a very pragmatic guy so everybody he wasn't someone who volunteered for the service he wasn't someone you know when he was called he went um but he was yeah he was working for Dravot. he's working in the war industry and he was building the ships they were going to use to invade Japan. Yeah. That's what those ships were for. And there must be, it must've been a ton of surplus after the war. Oh yeah. 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 He, he tells stories since he got, since he got drafted late, he was in the occupation. He tells stories about just the amount of material that they <laughs> sank. Wait, why? Just cause they had too much of it and who gives a fuck or no, I think, it, well, this may not, it's funny. I work for Caterpillar now, so this is, this is nothing to do with my day job. This is what he, he said at the time. Sure. But the apocryphal kind of story was um, like the, the tractors that they used to pull the howitzers were 
essentially the same tractors, you know, Caterpillar made them for the war effort. They were very similar to the regular tractors that Caterpillar would sell, you know, crawling, you know, steel tracked tractors they'd sell. And they might have had the equivalent of two, two to three years worth of Caterpillar's output in peacetime. (laughs) <laughs> so you would have killed and that's just one example you know same thing with gm the same thing you know you had so, so if you break one you don't fix it you just get the next one no no if they'd have brought it and they'd sold it you would have bankrupted some of these companies these companies that just won the war for you for general motors caterpillar whoever you had so much surplus equipment if if you sold it used and they repurposed all of it oh is, i because you're cannibalizing their yeah their sales right you're right got it okay so um, and that may not be true. There's history. People tell me I'm, I'm, I'm full of shit. I don't know. That's what my grandfather had, had said. But yeah. he said he remembers. That I that believe was, that. That was one of the things they would do. I and mean, they would just, they would sink this. The same thing with ammunition. Ammunition more because they didn't need it. Yeah. Well, they still do that. Like I have a or friend airplanes. that was in the Navy and, or sorry, in the Navy in the eighties. And he was telling me they just threw crates of like oh, yeah. depleted still- uranium rounds off the side of the boat because they had to use the ammunition up, which is insanely yeah. wasteful. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Oh, something they said like something like, well, oh, anyway, that's off topic. But anyway, what made him interesting, I think, were those life experiences. Sure. Very technical, very smart. Came back, um, and after the war here, there were a lot of uh, engineering and machinist, machinery companies that had sprouted up, especially during the war to support that. And much like now, like when you had the gas and oil boom and you had all these companies that sprouted up to do that, and once the price is stabilized... Only the ones who are good at it survived, right? So there were a lot of secondary and tertiary machine shops or suppliers for gas and oil where when, when the prices were outrageous and people would pay whatever, you could build a business around that. But that wasn't long-term sustainable. So it was the same way. He came back, and there wasn't a lot of work uh, for a welder and a machinist in, like, 1947 when he came back. Yeah. Um, so he ended up working on Is cars. Is that just because of the insane surplus that was created or probably uh, a few things? Yeah, there, there, were, there were just a – I mean, you build a workforce. You trained so many people in those trades oh, uh, to build was even a labor equipment. surplus because you just did a labor yeah, surplus. Yeah, in peacetime, yeah. you wouldn't need that crazy production yeah, you, machine. And yeah, and people thought there was going to be a, a depression after the war. There'd be so much of a labor surplus. That ended up not being true because the rest of the world was in ruins. So there, was, there were markets for American goods. You got to build goods. stuff for them. Yes, yeah. yeah. But it's the, even though there was a cert, anyway, the the labor market had kind of changed. Yeah. And when he came home, he uh, the job he could find, he went to work for a uh, a Plymouth dealer. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So he worked and worked as a me- as a uh, mechanic, la body work, learned that kind of thing. Ended up, you know, kind of moving up to the point of running the being this. I guess you'd call it the service writer. You know, ran the repair division of a small Plymouth dealer. And then uh, 1952, he started his own business. Oh, cool. I had someone I work with now, really, really great. I hate I hate the word leader. Yeah. Um, but someone who inspires you. Sure. Right? Like I, I've worked for so many shitty managers fits. who, when you call them up, like, dude, you're not doing your fucking job. I said, well, I'm a leader, not a manager. I'm like, if you say that, that means you're not. Like, yeah, don't, don't yeah, say that. You to shouldn't me. have to self-define um, that. Don't way. ever say that. Uh, it's like wearing the band, wearing the shirt of the band you're going to see. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, don't be that guy. Exactly. Um, but then, you know, other people I've worked for who, for, you know, you learn, I learned a lot about rhetoric, listening to reading Carlin, listening to Carlin and all these other things. And rhetoric is very useful to convey a point. Yeah. Up to a point. And then I, I work for a fellow, I've worked with a fellow who's like, can I give you some straight talk? Can I tell you something? I'm like, yeah. He's like, everything you're saying is correct. I'm like, thank you. He's like, and you're an asshole. <laughs> Like, wow. I love that he says and rather than but. <laughs> no, it's and. Yeah. It's and specifically. Yeah. And he's, he's like, hey, someone, you know. Ten You're not mutually ago, exclusive. Ten years ago, someone gave me the same input. Like being rhetorically correct doesn't matter sometimes. Get to the point where you're correct. You convey the fact that you're correct, then start to influence. Especially when you're young, sometimes you don't realize how interesting the stuff you're doing is going to be in post. Yeah. Um you just want to get it done. I was sick of it. I'm like, oh, this sucks. I just want to get home. You know, I don't want. I don't want to be here. We we we'd come to. We were doing some work for the Israelis, and then one of the other products went to Russia. It wasn't a robotics product, but it was a different one. And I can remember I came into work one day, and this this older fellow I worked with, really good mechanical engineer, grizzled biker, 
cool guy. That's awesome. Um, I came in one day. I'm like, what's up, Harry? He's like, fuck. Harry's like, dude, what's wrong? He's like, fuck. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? And this is in the day of paper airline tickets, right? This is, <laughs> this is like 2004. <laughs> so um, especially if you're flying international, there's paper tickets. Yeah. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, haven't you been to your desk? I'm like, no, I just got here. I was getting a coffee. He's like, go to your desk. I go to my desk and there's like, fuck <laughs> plane ticket. I'm like, I don't want to go to Russia. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, oh, we got a problem in Russia. Um, but it was a small company. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was do that kind do. it was that kind of a company where it's like, yeah. Hey, we shipped some stuff to Russia. Like we said, it doesn't work till it works on the machine. Yeah. We shipped the gear to Russia. Something broke. So like three of us had to go to St. Petersburg. There's worse places to go. Yeah. St. Petersburg was cool. I've not been there yet. It seems cool. Like it's, I had that one mentor from there. But. It's really be- I mean, it's it's interesting. It's beautiful. I was a little concerned because we were we were doing work at a nuclear plant, and they had a big banquet, and there was f- food. And there were fi- there were big fish. Oh, that's cool. On, on the on the the table, you know, on on the banquet table, and it's just because of the heat. In, in like in the U.S., you have to condition. If you're going to discharge water from any any process plant, manufacturing, power generation, anything, you have to cool it before you discharge it, <laughs> right? If you're taking water out of a river to cool your process reactor, whether it's again power generation or you could be making baby food, right? You're taking sure. taking water to cool, warming it up, cool it, you, then put it back. You got to put it, you got to put it back in the in the ecosystem. The same temperature you found within it a, within a bandwidth, yeah, right. A little different over there, you know. Oh, interesting. So they were they were dumping not scalding hot. They were dumping hot water, so the fish grew big. <laughs> Wait, as a result of being the in heat, hot water, that's, the heat. That's it, interesting. It, it changed the ecosystem. That's really interesting. But if a little bit of a home, you know, a little bit of a Simpsons moment, we're like, "This is a nuclear power plant. Like, why are these fish so big?" <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was just yeah, it, fish. <laughs> yeah, it was. No, they they were just big. Yeah. Um, so anyway, he worked for the small, like I said, we'd, we deployed this stuff to Israel. Yeah. We had another product line that was, um, it was not robots like we think now. It was somewhat, somewhat automation for decontamination activities. Yeah. But it wasn't like rover and manipulator. It was, it was automation for when you have to deal with contaminated pipes. So you're going to you know, need a remote system to cut a pipe that you know that has contamination you need, a, you, need, you need essentially a robot, but it's really just a, a fixture. Yeah. Yeah, it goes in and sort of sandblasts and cleans the inside of the pipe, get rid of the contamination, yeah, um, and then s- make sure it's safe for guys to go in there. So, well, when, that's interesting. Like if you have to cut, yeah, if you have to cut piping and th- that has contaminated, has radioactive water. Yeah, yeah I learned. I learned a bunch. You know. Not enough to actually be useful for to actually work in the industry, but I learned a little bit about nuclear reactors. Oh, cool! And the in the U and the uh, the Russians still have some older reactors, an older style. They're yeah. safe. You know, it's not like Pripyat. It's not like yeah, it's not the Chernobyl thing. <laughs> um, but they have what are called bo- called boiling water reactors. So nuclear reaction boils the boils the water, makes steam. Steam's steam is radioactive. Right, because it's in in containment, right? Yeah, it's in with the reaction, and that goes through the turbine, right? That makes sense. That, that's how you make. That's all. Rate. That's all a nuclear power plant does is it boils water. That's the way it's been explained to me. That's all it does. It boils water. Yeah, I was I was so let down when I learned that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was so much cooler than that. <laughs> but they um, in a boiling water reactor, the only difference is the 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 high pressure steam goes through the uh the turbine yeah to make the electricity in a pressure water reactor which we have in the u.s as an extra sort of redundant layer which is more expensive and more uh, it's more expensive and more cumbersome the steam that's contaminated goes through heat exchanger oh that's interesting so the contaminated water the contaminated steam doesn't go through the The turbine uh, itself the turbine yeah that's the only difference. So in, in Soviet plant or Russian plants. Oh, that's interesting. So, but that's got to be less efficient than the boiled water reactor. It is. But also less, 
you know, it's like, less. It's what's what's your trade off? It's less yeah. efficient, but then whenever you go to you discharge PM, contaminated water, no, no, it's not. You're not discharging it. Whenever you go to PM it, like whenever whenever the PM uh, periodic maintenance. Got it. Okay. Right. So whenever the turbine is at end of life, now the turbine is is radioactive. <laughs> Whereas if you have a heat exchanger, heat exchanger has a much long life. A much but the heat longer, exchanger is radioactive, but it's but it's got a longer life. The moving parts, yeah, right? yeah, it's got a much longer lifespan. Yeah, that makes so sense. it's just sort of, you know, the the U.S. plants were boiling water reactors originally. That's interesting. And then, you know, for whatever reason, you know, so anyway, they switch to a heat exchanger, and then they run that through the turbine. Yeah. yeah. So the, the this this product this company had, um, you end up having to cut into. In, in again, twenty years ago, the Russian plant. You would you, still be boiling the water, right, on the other side. Oh, of the, the heat bo- yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. The heat exchanger is still essentially the heat. You're, the water, the steam is so hot. Yeah. The heat exchanger is taking radioactive steam and boiling non-radioactive water into non-radioactive steam. Where the Russian plant all is doing. discharging hot radioactive Not water. Not discharging. No, 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 no. Okay. It's still a closed loop. Okay. It's still a closed loop. It's just whether or not. The radioactive water, the radioactive steam goes through the turbine. Yeah. Or whether you have an extra, think of it like a How relay. do the fish get so hot then? <laughs> well, because the water that goes out. So yeah. when you say hot in a yeah. radio, you know, when you're Oh, I see what you mean. Te- hot, temperature. High temperature. High is, temperature. Is what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. So when, you, you know, because you, you have cooling towers, whether, no matter what kind of planet it is, yeah. you still have, the, the cooling towers still have a, even a second, you know, completely separate loop. Oh, I see. Okay. So you're taking water from a river yep. and you're using that to cool the process. But that's not touching radioactivity. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. No, that no, makes no. sense. Not radioactive. Yeah. It doesn't go anywhere near the reactor. Whether, regardless probably. of what kind of yeah. plant, yeah, regardless of what kind of planet it is, the cooling water that's getting discharged is, and in the U.S., there's environmental laws that require you to make sure you're not discharging because if the water's too hot, you just kill the fish. Yeah. yeah. Right. Makes sense. So you want to make sure that you're not negatively impacting the environment. And you mean temperature hot, not radioactive temperature hot, hot. not yeah. Ra- yeah, not radioactive hot. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. But, so anyway, company had some interesting quasi robots for when you got to cut that, you got to, you can't have guys cut that pipe because there's, even though you drain it inside of the pipe has, re- has re- residue. It's yeah. radioactive. Makes sense. So you got to have a, a robot that can cut, you know, again, a quasi robot, cut it and then reach in and sort of with an abrasive sponge. Yeah. You know, go back and, you know, sort of do that, that for 10, 12 feet pipe, you know, decontaminate the end of the pipe so that you get it to a, and then you test it and you get it to a level where, where you can work on it. Oh, that's cool. You can put you can put you can put guys in there, and the limits are safe. That's awesome. So that was the other product that this company did. That again was really really cool, especially at the time. Now nuclear is sort of out of fad. No one would think it was interesting. Yeah. But I worked for this little company, 40, 40 45 people. Yeah. And again, production robots to the uh, Israeli government, and uh, like I said, these pipe and decon robots. Yeah. Quasi robots, more automated equipment than robots, really. Yeah, makes sense. Um, uh, to it in, into plants in Russia and in 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 the former Soviet republics. That's awesome. It was actually fun. It was funded by the U.S. DOE. Nice, because they you know the Russians didn't. And again, you go back twenty years. You're you're only five or seven years out. I don't know from the collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> So the U.S. The U.S. Uh, was attempting to probably government was propping them up, do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Like it's like, hey, you guys have these legacy plants. You don't have, yeah. You the U.S. did a lot there. That's a lot of things people don't don't realize now. 